up in our unconscious of this uh, collection of unused gems, but something that we could have made use of. And um, so the dreams, the little stories that occur are like the sort of purgatorial flip side of these jewels that have been neglected. And so now the king is forced to confront them, these jewels that he's been neglecting throughout his entire life. He's built up all this energy against them, and uh, now he's put through this kind of purgatorial process. On another level, it's almost like an allegory for reincarnation. He has to go for each story is like a new incarnation, and you, you don't get rid of the karma that is necessary to be burned off for that incarnation, um, then you brought back into the next one, and again and again and again until moksha is attained. And so there are any, like the uh, relationship that the king cannot figure out between the two the nephews and the uncles, the story can be looked at from all of these different points of view, and it just becomes this glittering, multifaceted uh, gem for uh, uh, what's going on in these myths. And so uh, I really like it for that uh, the kind of multidimensional polyphonic uh, uh, aspect of it. It's just uh, it's a wonderful series of stories. Is it polyphonic, polyphonic? Polyphonic is in the sense of uh, opposite of monophonic. Monophonic is uh, the traditional oh, Greek like music. Polyphonic is Western music where you have all these okay. different lines, harmonic lines working with each other. So it's okay. multiple, it's tiered. Okay. You know, it's basically Western classical music as opposed to traditional. So, uh, anybody? Uh, any reflections? I have a question. Um, I'm not sure how much it relates to the story, but it's kind of brought up by the story. Um, a lot of these myths are about kings. And, you know, early kings I know were kingdoms of, kings of very small kingdoms. Um, so they, they have an everyman quality to them. Um, and then, you know, all of our hi recent history, any king has been really an authority, and none of this stuff would have happened to a king as later kings. So um, it makes me wonder, how does the king work in the mythology? How did that change over time? And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the king is the, uh, originally, the whole concept of kingship originated in the Near East as the idea of uh, the king is at the top of the human great chain of being, just as the pope is. And, but if, and if you split the two in the Western tradition, you have king and pope, and the two are at the top. The one is at the top of the secular world, the earthly world, uh, the city of man. The other is at the top of the city of God. But both represent the pinnacle of the pyramid of the hierarchy of the great chain of being, just as God is at the top of the pyramid with all the hierarchies of angels and so forth. And so the king traditionally uh, and then too, there's an astrological dimension because the king originally, depending on which mythology you're talking about, would either be the incarnation of the moon or the incarnation of the sun. One or the other, but never any of the other planets. Uh, although Jupiter, of course, has mythological associations with kingship because Zeus is the ruler of the Olympian pantheon. But anyway, you look at it, the king is traditionally the sacred bearer. He bears the sort of mana, the, the primary sacred energy of the peoples in question. And he has all these taboos associated with him. And so myths and legends spring out with him as the central character because in these societies, the king was the interesting person. The king was the one, uh, you know, the Buddha is a king. S starts out as a king and uh, he renounces it, you know, or he's on the path toward becoming a king. And he renounces that. And so the king is the interesting figure. He's simply, the nobility is always, either the nobility or the priesthood are the people who live exceptional lives. And um, the rest of the people don't matter because they're all just this sort of common, uh, they're either tilling the fields or uh, performing some kind of task-oriented service. But there doesn't, usually there isn't anything exceptional about them. Unless you're talking about, uh, you know, the wizard is always exceptional because he's associated with the arts of the blacksmith, the magic of transforming uh, the metals through the fire that melts them down and then out of it you get this magical implement. So there's all, there's, it's my theory that the king is important because he's exceptional and embodies the destiny and will of the entire people in question. And even as Fraser writes in The Golden Bough, the king uh, has fertility associations in some of these traditions. If something happens to the king, if he grows old or weak or becomes sick, and he is embodying the fertility of the land, then that may actually have a magical effect on the land itself. And so very often you get this tie-in between uh, a wasteland situation happening and the king having some debility. Uh, in the Grail tradition, it's the amphortus wound in the side that the king has uh, which is an echo, of course, of the wound that Christ has on the cross when the spear pierces him. Um, 
So he embodies the, the fertility, the spirit of the land. And if there's anything wrong with him, then it's going to be reflected in the outer world. The king's sort of microcosm, the soul of the entire uh, people, just as in the Jungian system, the self would be the king of the psyche. It's the microcosm uh, of the entire psyche. The whole thing revolves around it. So very often you will get the king as an embodiment of the self. Either that or he embodies the ego. In, as in this case, he's in the role of the ego. He does not know. He is not the source of the knowledge. He is the one who's being instructed. He's the one who's learning. So he personifies the ego in this particular story. But sometimes, if he's this sort of all-wise old man figure uh, who knows, he's the personification then of the self, of the deep center of the psyche that is the source of all of the wisdom. So those are the two roles that you tend to find in them, uh, one or the other, uh, ego or self. Can you talk yeah. about a complete shift since uh, the French Revolution in particular. They're now the myths are of, of the people. The myths and plays and stories that have been written since the 19th century, and starting in the 19th century, you start losing interest in the nobility, and they're no longer main characters in the drama of Ibsen and Strindberg and Shaw and so forth. There's a new interest in the common man, you know, the average person, and they start coming on the stage, and the, now they're of interest. And uh, so we, these classical three estates have really melted down into the fourth estate, the mass in the civilization that we're in now. And conservatives always regard this as a decline. That's why Spangler wrote The Decline of the West to show how this represents the disintegration of the West. This loss of this hierarchical structure ends up with a sort of total disintegration of the structure in the society. And as a result of a lack of a structured society, you're going to have nothing but chaos uh, because there's nothing, uh, there are no containers to channel the chaos. There are no structures. And so Spangler says uh, the world wars are just the beginning. It's just when it's chaos, it's going to be constant because we're melting down all the structures, not only the social uh, archetypes, but the mythic archetypes that contain the energies of the psyche and the Christian tradition also began to really be wiped out in the 19th century. And all these energies were then unleashed that had nowhere to go, so they preyed upon a Western man in the outer world by exploding into these world wars that nobody really understands the cause of, why they happen. I mean, there are all these different theories, but uh, Young's theory is that, uh, with the and Spangler's also, is with the disintegration of the structured forms of society, uh, you have a reduction of society to chaos and barbarism. So the, yeah, the downside of, uh, of uh, and this happened to the Greeks and the Romans also, the downside of the disintegration of the nobility into the uh, fourth estate is always having to deal with chaos, mob rule. There's a constant threat of mob rule. and. Uh, then the flip side of this is Spangler says, and picking up from Aristotle's theory of the cycle of politics, is um, the political cycle is the movement traditionally, as it is in Aristotle, from kingship, which is theocracy ruled by divinity, to aristocracy, where you begin to get a, de a decentralization of the king's power, and it begins to spread out to the aristocracy. Uh, this happens in our case, uh, starting with the Magna Carta, where you have limitations. The barons come in and begin to put limitations on the king's power. So you shift into the aristocracy. Then when the third estate rises, the bourgeois, the middle classes, begin to come in and accumulate power to themselves. And uh, then you get a movement from theocracy to aristocracy, eventually to democracy, where you have the rule by the masses. And then Aristotle says, what inevitably happens is the rule of the masses will inevitably turn into mob rule, and you'll have chaos building up. And the only solution to that will be paradoxically a return back to rule by kingship, which in the Romans represents the rise of the Caesars. The Caesars come out of the disintegration of the Republic, and which is just, um, if you ever read Roman history, study that first century between the year zero and 100, and it's an exact analog for the 20th century. One civil war after the next, one public assassination after the next, and out of all of that civil and social chaos, gradually comes this new centralization of power in starting with Julius Caesar and then with Augustus Caesar. And so the whole political cycle comes back to where it started. And Spangler says, this is what lies in store for us.